on the previous episode of A Kingdom for My Horse. Are you crazy, Lord Cineard? You dare replace me, your loyal chancellor, with your steed? This is no mere steed, former counselor. Nay, this is Glitterhoof, and he will make this realm stable. Solhoof, I am dying. My will, you must instruct my children, the heirs to the weeb throne, in the ways of the horse. Enough with this horseplay. I'm your queen, and these beasts are outlawed in this kingdom. Kanul, what have you done with the prince? But I don't understand your language, Bojack. All you do is neigh at me. You, you want me to read this book? I, I... <laughs> Mares and stallions of Scotland arise, I am Lord Padur, progenitor of pony and man. House Weeb is descended from the seeds of royal steeds, and with my marriage to Bonnie the Mare, the liberation of Britannia is at hand. He looks just like his mother, Jangleberry the first of his name, our son. He will make a fine horse one day, a horse to mount the world. Jangleberry inherited the throne of Scotland in 843 AD, assuming the responsibilities of his castrated, satanic, and excommunicated horse-human father, Lord Padur. As the first thoroughbredded royal foal of his fiefdom, Jangleberry I of the Horse House Weeb was a mare 17 years old, and like most post-pubescent ponies, spent his days horsing around with handmaidens and passing off his steed seed to those in need. Indeed, the wives of his human subjects became increasingly saddled by surprise stallion spawnlings, but no one suspected full play. This was all part and parcel of Jingleberry's foolproof plan to reduce the reactionary elements of remaining humanity from his holdings. All humans were humanely sequestered into stables, where they received complimentary horse husbandry and universal horse care. But House Weeb was growing, and like any herd of horse-human hybrids, needed greener pastures for their proliferating progeny. Of course, this meant war, and in this case, the humans of Cumberland found themselves face to muzzle against our Scottish steeds. Resistance was futile, and while Jingleberry came, saw, and conquered Cumberland, he also sired his firstborn colt and heir, christened Bojack I, a commemoration to his great-grandfather's loyal chancellor. Despite the charge into and consequent conquest of Cumberland, our horse holdings were facing horse unrest. Separatist stallions led by High Chief Flame sought to create their own equestrian empire, and in these tumultuous times, Bojack was blinded in battle. To make matters worse, the right hoof of our realm, Ferd I, was attempting to mount a horse, as a horse, but luckily he was too fat. In the face of these mounting difficulties, the War of Equine Insurrection was all but over by 850 AD, resulting in the surrender and subsequent horse arrest of the Separatists. But away from the battlefield, the home front was far from stable. Boxer, the Royal Scottish Queen, was cheating on her mate, who happened to be the monarch of all horse holdings. Jingleberry promptly imprisoned this Countess of Cockery, ultimately ordering her to take the vows of chastity. With his stallion seed, secured by way of his son and heir, Bojack I, Jingleberry opted for a humble human bride in lieu of an unloyal mare, and chose Bertha to be his bipedal bride. For their human horse honeymoon, the couple opted for the island of Ireland, and thus Jingleberry had his stallions subjugate the land via forced vassalization in 860 AD. It is said that war never changes, and in the coming years, horse-held Britannia endured a Viking-led invasion of their equestrian estates. This disastrous and disappointing Danish disembarkment resulted in defeat for any notion of Dane law, and, with his realm now stable, Jingleberry ordered the invasion of Lancaster not a two years later. It was in this pursuit of prosperous pastures that our sovereign stallion met his maker. Though he fought bravely, the equine emperor was poisoned by Anglo-Saxon alcohol, and died to a perfidious plot by the Lords of Albion. 
In 865 AD, the stallion sovereignty of Scotland passed on to Jingleberry's son and heir, the 15-year-old Bojack I. Though saddled with the skirmishes and wars of his late father, Bojack was a brilliant strategist and competent commander of cavalry. At the spur of the moment, Bojack broke with the traditions of Horsehouse Weeb and opted for yet another bipedal bride, opting to marry and mount Rutild, the genius of House Huguenid. But the suspicious seed of his spouse resulted in omens surrounding her first pregnancy, culminating in the birth of the left hooved and ill fated Jingleberry II. This humble horse human hybrid was a mere microcosm of events transpiring throughout the realm, and subsequent horse families began moving into the land and displacing Scotsmen and Strathern. Any remaining human lords were forcibly married into Horsehouse Weeb, like Rudri, the homeless pretender of Mercia. In reward for his service, the horse hegemony carved out his claims from the hopeless humans of England, and the mare married count was granted the Duchy of Mercia. It was through this policy of equine eugenics that the stallions of Scotland were able to enforce their claims and endow their pony progeny over their nefarious neighbors in Albion. But outside of England, ill tidings soon fell over the Isle of Eyre. Bedouin Muslims of the House Badojas had conquered Munster, necessitating an equine intervention in 871 AD. War was fiercely waged between the Christian cavalry and Islamic infantry, but ultimately the Saracens were slaughtered on the shores of Scotland, resulting in the Bedouin Badojas besiegers relinquishing their human hands over Ireland. While Hibernia fell under the hooves of our horse holdings, humans yet reigned over the remnants of Bipede Britannia. The so-called King Ironheer of Wessex was made to bend the knee to the Herald of Horses, and nary two years later, this realm was pasturefied and mounted by the warriors of House Weeb. Back in court, Bojack was horsing around with the duplicitous Durlia pony, but his main maiden soon caught on. This was no mere misunderstanding, and Bojack was forced to confess to his infidelity. Our sovereign was saddled with stress, and opted to embrace celibacy to placate his human princess. Of course, this did nothing to prevent the birth of Rupert the Bastard, who was relegated to the stables and reluctantly acknowledged as a spawnling of the stallion sovereign. But in matters of faith, Christianity was becoming increasingly accepting of horse hegemony, and soon Scottish steeds were ascending to sainthood. It was at this point that Bojack neighed at Northumbria, and unleashed the steeds of war in 878 to vassalize their human holdings. On the eve of victory, Bojack's half-brother Padur declared war for the throne as a pretender. The steeds of Scotland galloped over the gall of their sovereign's step-siblings' pretenses while mopping up the negligible Northumbrian resistance. Humans were swept off their lands, and their holdings were granted to equestrian earls. It was in this epoch of Scottish steed supremacy that a mysterious marble man approached Bojack I. He implored his animal Autark to search the highlands of Scotland, where steed scouts soon reported the sightings of a unicorn. With this prophecy fulfilled, Bojack gave the half-horse hero a proper burial, and took its horn, which heralded the symbol of horsekind salvation. And speaking of horse kind, horse hegemony was under threat of incessant human insurrection, this time in Northumbria. These backwards British bipeds were crushed under the hooves of Horsehouse Weeb, and their lands were repurposed into gelding grazing grounds. This cult crusade extended into the Emirate of Cornwall, where Muslim human hands soon passed to Christian horse hooves. But soon, Irish infantry mounted yet more resistance to our resettlement policies, culminating in the Declaration of Irish Independence and the concurrent yet curious spontaneous establishment of the title of Empire of Britannia. Any notion of Irish independence was subsequently extinguished, and by 900 AD, the stallion sovereign had galloped past the Pale and vanquished the Gaulish lands, paving the way for horse resettlement. It was a time of miracles for the horse empire, and soon the holy human pope implored our horse heroes to join him in crusade against the infidels of Al Quds. The sacred Scottish steeds took to the seven seas and joined their co-confessionals in the conquest of Jerusalem. 
In honor of our pony polity's participation and the horse occupation of Acre, House Weeb was awarded the Sheikdom of Safid upon the conclusion of the Christian Crusade. While the Berber Christian queen, Leoju I, was coronated as holder of the Holy Lands, Count Hornline served as loyal steed to the New Kingdom, supplanting Saracen sovereignty with the seat of House Weeb on the shores of Asia itself. The human horse progeny of Padur was now in the Holy Land, but our attention would soon return to the horse homeland of Britannia. Bojack was getting older, and in his increasingly old age, he sought to prune his pony progeny and dueled his children to the death, killing Jangleberry the first, the third, and the fourth in brutal combat. Only Jangleberry the second neighed at his father's neglect and wounded the senile steed. Back on the war front, the final fiefdoms of England and Wales fell under the hoofs of horse kind, and by 905 AD, it was all over. The last remaining holdouts of humanity were wiped from Britannia, and all remaining humans had their human rights revoked. Bojack's speciest and totalitarian rule resulted in the displacement of any remaining human dukes. He opened the realm to all horses and gave them the right to return, which was met by a stampede of horse migration. So great was this migration that by 910 AD, nearly 90% of the Isles were ruled by direct horse holdings, and a further 20% of the Empire was fully entrenched in horse culture across Scotland, Ireland, and England. Indeed, Bojack's deeds and bountiful seed secured his legacy as a paragon of virtue, and he soon set about forging his bloodline. The only option, of horse, was the bloodline of the Perfect Knight, which granted all of his horse house cavalry combat bonuses. But the realm was far from stable. Pestilence and plague ravaged our horse holdings in 912 AD, and, sensing weakness, the humans declared a desperate war for independence in 913. Though this malaise of mutiny and smallpox was short-lived, Bojack was himself ravaged by time and battle, and passed into horse heaven in 919 at the age of 70. The reins of rulership thus passed to the bastard hooves of Rupert the Mule, a 43-year-old Satanist and conspicuous cult member, barn of the offspring of Bojack's dalliance with Dorelia Pony. In many ways, Rupert was in denial of his horse heritage, and earnestly believed that he was a crypto-pagan pig that just so happened to think in horse all of the time. In fact, many thoroughbred stallions were in denial of their hooves, and carried themselves on their hind legs like the pathetic people of the past. These human-cultured horses were a mockery of their previous monarch's machinations, but Rupert had more pressing matters to attend to. His first order of business was to secure his power base from his siblings, and, logically, he used the power of Satan to curse his horse-cultured human half-brother who had inherited the Kingdom of Pictland. Praising Hades, his bastard brother now had rabies, but the power of the dark side resulted in abilities some considered to be unnatural, and soon the horse emperor of Alba was serving man. Rupert was out for blood, and soon his bipedal nephew, Baca Hurst, succumbed to rabies, with his titles and claims falling to Charlotte, Rupert's niece, and the newly coronated queen of Pickland. After an incident of not-so-friendly fire, Charlotte's body passed into hell, while her titles passed into the hoofs of our satanic sovereign. With his reign secure, Rupert was at last able to adopt to the culture of the horses he ruled, and he thus cast aside any pretenses of being a human in 922 AD. Seven years later, it was nigh time to be coronated as emperor of his equestrian lands. Of course, only the Pope was fit for this role, but the Holy Father had other plans. In exchange for a papal coronation, Rupert had to give up Jesus' foreskin, a family heirloom that belonged to Horsehouse Weeb for generations. After ponying up the phallic prepuce, Rupert was coronated by the Pope, and at last became Emperor of Britannia and her horse holdings. But the pursuit of power was never enough. Lying awake in his sublime stable, Rupert soon questioned his own mortality. At three in the morning, he summoned his court and implored his marshal, Earl Bojack, to lead an international expedition in the pursuit of immortality. 
While the equine Earl traveled across the land, searching far and wide, Rupert succumbed to satanic setbacks and became a hunchback horse. At the threshold of despair, good news soon arrived, and Bojack had returned to court with a mysterious sage from Senegal. This wise woman, known only as Jinli, promised to assist Rupert with his quest to live forever, so long as he would submit himself as student to her wayward ways. She soon took a prominent position in court, and Rupert had to make a move. But Jinli was preoccupied with a serpent of a different kind, and informed her thirsty Tutti that he was nothing more than a friend. But before Rupert could invoke his neighing techniques, he was confronted by a surprise snake that Jinli had sprung upon him. Grabbing the beast by the neck, Rupert bashed it into his bedside table, and though his hooves were sweaty and his maiden spaghetti was spilled across the floor, Rupert had impressed his serpentine senpai. She offered her satanic student a sip of mysterious mead, with which Rupert guzzled with the thirst of a sexually repressed stallion. His foolproof plan to achieve immortality had finally paid off, and Rupert's bloodline was now imbued with the power of his ancestors. But immortality was no cure for insanity, and at a state dinner, Rupert realized he was hairier than any horse should be, and began howling at the full moon. It was at this time that the satanic sovereign and horse emperor found himself to be a werewolf, and by 934, almost all of his holdings were held by horse hooves. In celebration, Rupert dined on Chinese food, which arrived in the form of a Han delegation. And speaking of Eastern affairs, the Holy Human Father had declared yet another crusade, and Rupert was quick to pledge his ponies to the cause. Horses soon crossed the sea for the second time in horse story, and Rupert arrived upon the shores of Egypt to become the second cult crusader in imperial memory. With the combined power of Satanism and Werewolfism, the equine emperor captured the port of Andingawea, contributing a vital component to the Christian war effort. By 942 AD, the crusade was all but over, and, due in part to his calculated contributions, the monarch's third cousin, Blackjack, was coronated as king of Christian Egypt. By the glory of God, House Weeb was now worldwide, but a mere three years later, Blackjack was assassinated and a jihad was declared on the colonial horse holdings. Back in Britannia, a satanic scheme of sizable scale was under hoof. The reanimated husk of Rupert the Mule set about reforming Britannia's legal system in an effort to invoke free investure and reduce papal political power. The Scottish steed senators conceded to the horse play of their hegemon, and soon Rupert was in position to appoint and anoint a bishop of his own. The evil emperor had Prince Bishop Bacchahast corrupted by Satan, and the sacrilegious steed was subsequently appointed as Britannia's anti-pope in 945 AD. Catholicism itself was now under siege by horrifying horseplay, and Rupert's selected stallion was coronated as Pope Nicolaus II, who now held claim over the papal palaces of Rome itself. Human heretics had no place in this brave new world, and thus Rupert declared war to unroot Pope Benedictus IV once and for all. A massive fleet of nearly 14,000 steeds took to the seas, landing in the heart of the Holy See to see that the papal army was nowhere to be found. Unbeknownst to our satanic stallion sovereign, the papal pretender's 9,000 strong army was already in equine England, sacking horse holdings in retribution. Rupert thus sent out a contingent of 12,000 cavalry to stop the Pope from breaching London. Landing in Dover, they routed the Papist pretenders outside the capital, breaking their resistance again and again across the baronies of Brony Britannia. Facing extinction, Benedictus led his men in a last stand on the Isle of Wight, but resistance was futile, and the Italian invaders were dismembered limb from limb. The Christian capital now laid bare and fell under the gate and gallop of the conquering cavalry, and by 949, it was all over. The pernicious pope ponied up the papal states, and a new chapter in horse story was set to unfold. Pony Pope Nicholas II was now the horse pope of Rome, and the Holy See a subject of imperial horse Britannia. 
Christians across the continent had no choice but to accept this satanic steed as the new head of their faith, and moral authority reigned in stable manner across Christendom. But back in the motherland of mares, the last of the humans in Britain was sacrificed to Satan and subsequently replaced by horse-cultured lords. The effects of over a century and a half of horse rule had reduced bipedal Britons to a minority in their ancestral lands. In effect, no humans existed as subject to our sovereign steed, and more than 40% of Britannia now belonged to purebred horse culture. Any remaining humans and human-horse sympathizers were placed into horse arrest. Further abroad, horse-cultured humans of House Weeb remained in total control of Egypt, and this excluded the horse holdings in Jerusalem and the Pony Pope of Rome. The Emperor of Imperial Horse Britannia is a 74-year-old immortal horse Satanist, with six human horse hybrid children, over 50 confirmed kills, and a family of over 160 members in Horse House Weeb. At the dawn of 950 AD, humanity stood at the precipice of ruin in the face of steed supremacy. Before ending the video, I'd like to say that this footage is nearly two years old, and has lied dormant on my external hard drive since the release of its prequel, the CK2 Horse Only Challenge. If you're looking to get your hooves on more horse lore, I'd recommend checking out this video, which is linkable as a card at the top right of your screen. That being said, the save file has long since disappeared, and I would have liked to have shown more footage on House Weeb's family tree and the global political situation. In terms of mods, this playthrough was almost entirely vanilla, but it did use the excellent Full Portraits mod by Ozodal and the Horse Arrest mod by McDorf for extra RP. These are both awesome mods, and I'll leave a link to them in the description box below if you're looking to horse around yourself. I'd like to thank everyone for supporting the channel, as we've recently crossed the 100,000 subscriber milestone. Y'all have been asking for a sequel to the Horse Challenge for nearly two years now, and it is for this commemoration that it's finally here. I can only cross my hooves that Paradox allows us to create human-horse hybrids in a future CK3 DLC, where we can finally return and restore House Weeb to rule the third and final trilogy of this series. I'd also like to thank everyone for watching this far and supporting the YouTube algorithm. If you'd like to see more content and want to help the channel grow, I'd also suggest fabricating a claim on the like button and usurping the channel's subscription box. If you want to boost relations even more, consider donating to our Patreon, buying games through our Nexus store, or donating basic attention tokens to AlzaboHD through the Brave browser. One day, we may return to CK2, but until then, I'll catch you on next week's video. It's time now to roll the credits.